Hi ladies, you're listening to The Goodness Podcast. My name is Noor Tahini. I'm the co-founder of Goodness and I'll be your host today. Goodness was launched in 2018 as a platform dedicated to tackling topics surrounding women's health in a real and honest way. And we're continuing on that mission with the launch of this podcast series, which will feature real women and real stories from the Middle East. My guest on the podcast today is Dr. Lanell, a naturopathic physician and medical director as well as the founder of the Chiron Clinic in Dubai. Dr. Linnell is also a Buddhist, a surfer, and an all-round wealth of knowledge on holistic wellness. Hi, Dr. Linnell. Hi, Noor. How are you? <laughs> I'm good. How are you? Yeah, really good. Um, you just got back from holiday, right? Yes, I did. Where were you? I went to Nepal for a week with my daughter. How nice. Mm. Like a relaxing holiday? She's starting to question uh, spirituality and meditation. And so we did, we went and stayed at a monastery for a week and did a meditation and uh, a little bit of exploration of Buddhism. How was that? Did she enjoy it? Yeah, she loved it actually. Yeah, she did really well for being the youngest person there. Are, is that a practice that you hold very dear? It is. Yes, I've been teaching meditation for probably over 20 years now. I didn't know you taught meditation. Yeah. Kind of the core of me. <laughs> One of the many anyway. things that you do. <laughs> yeah. What kind of meditation are you into? Mindfulness. But meditation is quite vast. But meditation is one of those things that, what kind of meditation? It's not, I'm a Tibetan Buddhist for the last 25 years. Do I teach Buddhism? No, but I do teach mindfulness and mindfulness-based stress reduction. Mm -hmm. I'm not a certified MBSR because that wasn't a thing when I started teaching meditation. But definitely I teach single-pointed concentrated meditation and then opening ourselves. And more, most importantly, how to be mostly in yourself, how to become more and more who you really are and let go of who you aren't. Do you find it easy to grasp the immediate benefits of meditation? Is that something that is easy to sense? Personally, yes. Yes. Um, from a patient or an individual perspective or as a beginner meditator I would say no it's really challenging uh, I think most people I start with five minute meditations every patient probably has been asked to do homework from me and usually I start with four or five minute meditations twice a day and I just challenge them to do the homework for 10 days and let me know what the changes are because if you do a small amount of meditation or mindfulness and bring it to your daily life, consistency is the key. Mm -hmm. Because then in 10 days, you do really notice it's mm -hmm. starting a difference. For yeah, sure. yeah. Mm -hmm. I always thought that if I could feel the difference faster, I'd be able to stick to it for longer. Mm -hmm. But like you said, it takes, it's a practice, right? So it mm -hmm. takes practice, mm -hmm. it takes remembering. So teaching mindfulness is just one of the many things that you do, right? Yes. <laughs> um, you, you are an integrative, functional, naturopathic, and <laughs> anthroposophical. <laughs> I have to doctor. write that down and I still can't read it. Doctor, could you explain to our listeners what that is? Sure. I think the best way to explain it first is just to start with what is conventional medicine. Mm -hmm. Conventional medicine is the known medical model, scientific approach to a, a systematic based um, approach here is a medication to stop a symptom mm -hmm. it's it's not very holistic it can be holistic and i think a lot of conventional doctors are leaning towards a holistic approach a holistic approach is looking at an individual as an individual as a, a human not just a symptom picture as somebody who is got a spirit, a soul, and an energetic body, and is a physical human being, so in totality. And I think that is foremost kind of the model that then integrative medicine and functional naturopathic and anthroposophical medicine approaches. That what does sense. anthroposophical mean? <laughs> anthroposophical medicine. It's a mouthful. It took me about two years to actually be able to say it. Anthroposophical medicine is looking at the human in context of a spirit and a soul and how the spirit and soul actually integrate into your cells, into your organ and into your physicality. Mm. So for me, integrative medicine combines everything, including conventional medicine. 
So at the clinic, we are an integrative clinic. We try to work in a team environment using what's best for the patient. It might be a conventional approach. Sometimes you might need a medication. You might need an antibiotic, for instance. But you can be doing a lot of complementary things at the same time. So integrative medicine is really taking everything, what works, and combining it together, what's best suited for the individual. From an anthroposophical perspective, I started getting into that approach because I found even functional and naturopathic medicine didn't address everything. So we can go, we can look at you functionally. We can see the biochemistry and your physiology and how well things are functioning and improve that and support your cells biochemically and your organ function. And naturopathic medicine are basically the principles that both fall onto, trying to look at you as a whole, trying to um, treat the cause and using the least invasive means to do so. But anthroposophical medicine looks at really more what else is missing. The, the spirituality part of you is much bigger than you, than our confines of our physical body. And we don't focus on that yeah. nearly enough. Yeah. And how you are in the world, your life purpose, how you feel um, in con- combination and in relative in relativity to everything around you is really the most important thing, actually. And we don't focus on that at all. Even in naturopathic medicine, we we talk about mind, body, soul, but we don't really know what that really mm. means. For me, anthroposophical medicine is just a model of how what are what are things that are imbalanced? And when you're functioning well and you're doing all the things right, you have a clean life, you're feeling well physically and there's still things missing, then you have to look a little bit deeper. And healing sometimes is really about healing on an inner level. I mean, true healing mm. is actually looking within and seeing what you have to overcome in yourself that you haven't yet, especially as we age. Yeah. I always sense. feel like if there really is truth to us being energetic bodies, energetic beings, and Mm. to the benefits of spiritual practices. And if you live your life without actually tapping into that and going deeper, then I feel like you're missing out on a big part of life and maybe even a big part of your potential Mm. and what you could do. What did you study (laughs) to? Did you start with conventional medical studies? In North America, naturopathic doctors are similar to GPs. Mm -hmm. And so I did my first degree in biological sciences, so general science and biology. And then I did a four-year full-time degree in naturopathic medicine. Okay. And so my first degree is naturopathic medicine. And then I just started doing more and more. I did a lot of extra acupuncture. I did a lot of counseling. Mm -hmm. And then I got into anthroposophical medicine and did the studying for that, which was quite a few years. Yeah. What have you seen in terms of studies and research that make a case for the importance of the spirit and Mm. the soul in medicine? Mm. Because I think, I imagine that it's something people might describe as pseudoscience or people might be skeptical about, but when you work in it and when you've studied it, then you've seen another side to it. You've seen maybe even in your practice, the kind of benefits that it can have and how it can transform people. I don't think there's enough scientific research yet. I think it's an exploding field right now. Joe Dispenza has spent the last 20 to 30 years on research of mindfulness and meditation. And I think he's done the most for heart rate variants, for brainwave research, MRIs, et cetera, showing the power of your mind. Do you know the story of his spine? Yes. Could you tell our listeners the story? (laughs) (laughs) So Joe Dispenza is a chiropractor. I believe he's American. Uh, Many years ago, this because he, what the bleep do we know anyway, was about 25 years ago, which was uh, one of the first documentaries using evidence-based research, trying to look and explore the mind and what consciousness was. And he was really featured and was really focused on that documentary. So probably at least 30 years ago, as a guesstimate, but he was in a cycling accident and he was flat for many, many months. And I, I think he must have became his own demon 
and his own healer in, in one. I think his mind was, he got to a point where he decided that he would choose to walk again and he would manifest that. And through mindfulness and pure meditation and will and strength of the mind, he did that. And then he's dedicated the rest of his entire life to doing research and meditating himself and helping other people to get to the same place. It's a it's a crazy story. I remember watching an interview with him online and he was sharing how he had after his accident, the, the doctors had told him that he had to go through very risky surgery if he ever mm -hmm. wanted to walk again. And because of his medical background, he knew the risks associated with it. And so instead, once he was able to maybe get himself out of a darker place, he would spend hours and hours every day reimagining his spine being put together and he and every time he would lose focus he would start from scratch to the point where where he was spending hours rebuilding his spine every day and then he got up and walked one day i don't know if it was that um mm -hmm. e quick or easy yeah. but yeah i think it's an incredible story yeah. and i think it's true we have a patient who is a beautiful human being who had stage four cancer and recently has been doing a lot of inner work and she's been to see Tony Robbins recently been to also um, a, the week long program with Joe Dispenza and she's just been cleared and nobody understands why but I think it's because she really has chosen inwardly to do the work on a very high level which then can reprogram your entire nervous system that's the beauty of it your mind is unlimited so what's happening on the inside to your mind your soul your spirit can have physical manifestations. Yeah, think of it the other way. Think of it as your physical body is like a book. It's a storybook of every thought and feeling you've ever had. It's, uh, it's a physical manifestation of your spirit and soul. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I was, uh, I, I had interrupted you when you were telling me about the things that you're seeing and the, and the proof that you're seeing in your work. Well, I think, people are waking up more and more consciously. And so they, they're starting to realize that healing, A, there's no pill, there's no supplement, there's no even alternative treatment that heals you. You actually heal yourself. And people didn't really understand that unless they fully experience it themselves. But it, it gets to the point where they feel great, but then if they want to go to a deeper level, then they have to take more responsibility on and they have to learn what the mind is to them. Yeah. And it is much more about allowing our, our consciousness to grow and become more and more, which is letting go of traumas. It's letting go of all the limited beliefs that you have carried since your childhood from wherever they came from and learning, becoming more and more acutely objective and being able to see the person that you are and who you truly are as two different people and sort of striving towards who you really are mm. and letting go of what you know of, which is a bit scary for a lot of people, but it's the most rewarding thing you'll ever do as a human being when you go through that. And I think there's not, for me, it's clinical evidence. There's not a lot of scientific proof other than we do have a lot more heart rate variants and like I said, all the mm. brainwave studies that are out there. They're doing Oxford and a, a couple of the big universities in the States have done a lot of mindfulness research. They now both, there's about four or five universities that offer masters in mindfulness based wow. um, therapy. And so they're finally starting to fund mindfulness research. But the evidence is you. Mm. You are what you put the work into. Yeah. Yeah. How do you approach your own health? Uh, the biggest rule of thumb is I practice what I preach. Mm -hmm. And actually, I'm so naive that I didn't realize that some people didn't do that. Who are in my field. I understand conventional doctors. I've been to, I know quite a few conventional doctors, especially in town. And so, yes, I realize that not everybody practices what they preach, but even in the naturopathic and functional world, a lot of people don't practice what they preach. I think that comes with age and wisdom and healing your own self. But from the day one, I've always, when I went to school, I went to school because I believed in it. I had both my kids quite early into my career and actually just finishing school. And so right from the get-go, I thought it was 
fundamental to parenting and being an embodiment of health is, mm. is my patients listen to me because I have experience. I never give a diet to somebody unless I've done it myself. So if you had to describe your approach to health, it's mind, body, soul. It, it, it's truly holistic. Yes. What are the different components that go into a healthy mind, a healthy body, and a healthy soul? From a day-to-day mm -hmm. basis? Mm -hmm. Okay. I spend a lot of time adjusting myself. I spend a lot of time meditating. I think that's fundamental. We focus so much on physical activity, and for sure, everybody needs to move. I, I think every human needs to walk, exercise, do cardio, but every human needs as much time as you spend on your physical activity, you actually need to go inward within yourself, mm -hmm. which means some sort of meditation. And meditation isn't the opposite. A lot of pe people think meditation is about leaving yourself and leaving stress and kind of just floating around in the abyss. But it's actually not. When you learn single-pointed awareness and concentration, it allows you to have the space to bring in all the things you actually have to work on on your own self and, and change limited beliefs about yourself, thing, questions you have within yourself, because nobody can heal you better than your own self. You know in everything there is to know about the universe, it's within you, and every human has that innate wisdom, and everybody can ask those questions. So part of my job is to teach people how to do that, but I do it myself or else I can never teach people how to do that. But I spend a lot of time in meditation. I have my own meditation room set up. I do a lot of adjusting on myself. I do a lot of inner work. What do you mean by adjusting? I do an adjustment technique which specifically works on your nervous system. Mm -hmm. It's called KST. It's originally a type of chiropractic. Ted Corrin, a chiropractor from the States, started the technique probably about uh, 15 years ago. I'm one of the mentors globally and I've been doing the technique probably for at least eight to ten years mm -hmm. in the last few years I've developed sort of a branch of that technique to my own where it's sort of like it's tra it's a type of trauma release but it's also like soul retrieval and it's kind of uh, shaman regression therapy all in one type of hands-on adjusting And the nice thing about any type of KST is you can do it on yourself. So if your lower back is out, as long as you can reach it, you can actually adjust yourself. But doing this type of work allows me to work with somebody else and tell them and experience with them what trauma they have to re remove, what are blockages that are weighing their nervous system down and causing actually biochemical dysfunction. So there's two parts to the story of true healing. One is empowering yourself and becoming more and more your values and your highest self at the same time as letting go of who you aren't, mm -hmm. which is all your limited beliefs, all of your traumas that you're living through. So it's a two-part process. And in my own practice, I do a lot of that every day. I would say at least five or six days a week, I make sure I'm A, meditating, clearing my mind, and then working on what's next priority in my own healing. Mm. What else do I have to let go of? Mm. What are things that are still triggering me that I need to overcome? Why do they trigger me? And how do I get over it, actually, and get the learning from it so I can move forward? Do you ever reach that point, or is it a lifelong journey? I think it's a lifelong journey. I think people can get to that point. Mm -hmm. I think people can completely lose their ego and become their highest self. But it is, it's a huge amount of work and dedication. And yes, definitely being a human is a path of striving to become more and more human. How do you approach nutrition? I know it's a big part of naturopathic yeah. medicine. Nutrition is, uh, I've been vegan almost most of my adult life. Uh, when I was pregnant, I started eating fish for many years. And to get through medical school, I ate fish because I couldn't keep up with the lifestyle and being pregnant at the same time. Um, now, I'm, I would say I'm almost completely plant-based. Occasionally, I might eat a, a bit of seafood, but it's almost a rarity. I eat super clean. I'm very anti-inflammatory. For me, in my own practice, it's a way of anti-aging as I approach 50. Shh, don't tell too many people that. Actually, <laughs> I'm kind of proud of it. But as I approach 50 this year, it's about 
anti-aging for me and imparting anti-aging to other people when they ask for anti-aging, I don't want to just give hormones to people. For me, it's from the inside out. If you still see wonder in the world, if you let go of all your traumas and live in your highest self, then you are anti-aging. You're actually going younger and younger and younger from within. Nutrition is similar. So I'm on a very anti-inflammatory diet. I don't eat gluten. I don't eat dairy. I, I eat a lot of um, well, 90% of my food is plant-based, mm. or if not 100%, mm. to be honest. Yeah. Um, I eat a lot of raw food. Food. I'm a warrior, intermittent faster. I have about a four-hour eating window. What's a warrior? Window. Warrior intermittent fasting is a four-hour eating window. Win- eating window. What? Yeah, so I usually, on the weekends, I don't, but during five days a week, I usually fast and just have a very narrow window. Mm. This is very fresh in my mind because I actually saw it yesterday, but there's some research that's coming out about the fact that intermittent fasting can be harmful to to women in their reproductive years. Have you seen anything to support that? I haven't. I think in general, it depends on what's going on with an individual. Intermittent fasting increases detoxification processes. I think it can be abused. I think it depends on what's going on in your in within you it, I, I've known a lot of women who are like I'm intermittent fasting but they are doing it for controlling weight loss yes um, and body image and that's not a healthy place I haven't actually heard, seen that research yet so I'm not sure I can't really comment on the research specifically but sure if somebody's not eating or just doing a warrior fast and has no background of fasting and doesn't know their body well enough then i would say yes it's not necessarily good for them if somebody for instance i've just had a little bit about of deli belly from traveling um i was forced to fast for a week and yeah then i couldn't go back into my own routine then it's about actually treating my body therapeutically mm-hmm. And I've been eating all day, every day for a few days. Just I'm so excited to be able to eat food now. So, <laughs> so now yeah. I'm on a 24-hour yeah. eating schedule almost. But yeah, I think every human being is different. I don't think there's one. You know, we have these trends. Mm. Um, I've been fasting and doing therapeutic fasting for years, for 20 years. And in the last three or four years, intermittent fasting has become this huge trend on the scene. I think what happens is celebrities get caught into something that works really well with them and then they share it and then all of a sudden it becomes a super big trend. But you don't realize that the celebrities have teams of people around them making sure right, that everything exactly. is done in the right way. Yeah. yeah. And it and it should, a lot of those things should be medically supervised. I'm a huge therapeutic faster, but all of those things should be supervised. I would never recommend somebody to do a warrior fast like me unless it was supervised. Mm. Yeah. Do you also believe that anyone embarking in any kind of fast or detox needs to be doing things on the side to also support the body's detoxification? I think it's better. Yeah. I think it's a lot better for you. And I think there's so many self... Google is amazing. Mm. Dr. Google is amazing for so many things, but I don't think it always has the correct information. Mm -hmm. And as an individual... I think it's better to get information from a coach or from somebody, Doctor, yeah. from a physician. Yeah. 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 There's a lot of debate around detoxing. Mm-hmm. There's um, two camps from what I've seen. There are people who believe that you should detox your body because the body has never been so exposed to this many toxins. And then mm-hmm. the other camp that says that your body is completely able of detoxifying itself. It's an interesting question. We had this question at a global naturopathic conference a couple of years ago in London. And the question was, how do you know when a patient's detoxed? Mm. It's a famous question. Yeah. How do you know when you are detoxed? It's an ongoing process. I think from a clinician's perspective, people come in and they clearly have clinical symptoms that are related to toxification issues. Okay. So I can tell when somebody's liver is sluggish. I can tell when somebody's not detoxing properly. I can tell when somebody's suffering from mitochondrial dysfunction. And so when there are clinical symptoms, then yes, detoxification pathways are slowed down. Genetically, we do testing in the clinic. We check your DNA and I can tell you, okay, guess what? Out of five SNPs for detoxification pathways, 
you're awesome uh, as a detoxifier genetically, or you have two SNPs out of five and your detoxification pathways are actually probably reduced 20 to 30 percent. So that means that the current environmental load that you have, we can become much more individualized and we can look at you and say, well, actually, because of your genes, we know that you detoxify less. So with the current load that's on you right now, you actually do need to be doing something regularly. I do think that most people are more toxic than they should be. We live in an epidemic of inflammation. Every major chronic illness, every hormonal issue that ever existed was from inflammation. So inflammation increases the amount of inflammatory mediators on a biochemical perspective, on a cell level, which increases the amount of, that your body needs to detoxify. Yeah. What, what are the main contributors to inflammation? If, if all of the major chronic illnesses that you're seeing are due to inflammation, yeah. what are the main contributors to that? Still, I'm going to say your thoughts first okay. and foremost, your thoughts, your beliefs, and your feelings. So if you are in toxic thinking of patterns, it becomes in a nervous system pattern. Those patterns become, which is scientifically proven, those become neurological patterns, which cause certain chemicals to be released and cause certain biochemical reactions, which then, then manifest as uh, slowing functionality down. So then it slows down your detox pathways. It slows down mitochondrial function. It allows you to be more susceptible to other things, which are environmental load. So food, food is the biggest inflammatory, I would say secondary to your thoughts, which are not direct. You can't take that word for word. Thoughts don't directly cause inflammation. That's not proven, but indirectly for sure. It's the basis for everything. But food, for instance, the way food is produced, the way it's grown, the quality of food, it's now about quantity and about making money. Mm -hmm. And I think when our grandparents were around, there didn't need to be terms coined as organic food. I remember going to my grandma's when I was really small and they still had glass bottles of raw milk delivered. Mm. Um, That shows you how old I am, but that was totally normal. And so when I was growing up also in the 80s, there wasn't a lot of kids with allergies uh, in school. Hardly yeah. anybody had peanut allergies. Gluten sensitivities were not a non-existence. Nowadays, I would say that eight out of 10 people have food sensitivities, if not more. Mm-hmm. And it's because the, the quality of food is a lot poorer. They've done research showing that Um, A study showing, a 20-year study showing the difference between organic and non-organic food and nutritional aspect, and then 20 years later, and there's definitely a general decline in nutritional status of both inorganic and organic food, but obviously inorganic food has a lot lower status. Our environment is polluted. We, you know, and that comes back to our inner thinking. I think the corporate mentality of trying to make as much money and everything's based on numbers and humans are driven to be like robots is destroying everything, including our own humanity. And so it does start with one human being trying to change their thinking and feeling and cleaning them so they just manifest and like ripples on a pond and we in fact turn into a unity kind of consciousness. And have projects like yours, right? <laughs> That's the <a> dream, right? <laughs> right? But what you're doing is rippling out and making yeah. people wake up and think about wealth. Uh, sorry, well, not wealth. Health. <laughs> Health and wellness. Yeah. Right? Yeah, true. Yeah. So we need more people like you and I. On the note of food, where do you source your food here? There's a lot more options than there were a few years ago. Yeah. I've been here since before there was organic food. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so... And it's amazing because I'm starting to work a bit in London and I go to um, the UK often. And you know what? Dubai is amazing. We have so many more options than London. People will argue with me, but I really (laughs) believe that to be the truth. You can't find an Asahi bowl at every street corner. You can (laughs) True. (laughs) True. I think um, I'm a big fan of some of the people who are in it for the right reasons, Mm -hmm. for their intention, because there's a lot of people in Dubai who are in it because of the market rather than for the right reasons. Mm -hmm. So I'm definitely always connected more to the heart of the initiative rather than the marketing aspect of it. So 
Good Heart Organics mm. is a great place. Green Heart. Or, sorry, Green Heart. Yeah. I just visited their farm last week oh, in Sharjah. Yeah. Oh, amazing. So beautiful. Yeah, I actually haven't been to their farm, but yeah. I love their little their little shop and I know she does it from the bottom of her heart. What I what I loved so much is the fact that they use I think that's the right word, regenerative agriculture to avoid mm. having to use pesticides. So for mm. example, they grow with their sweet peppers, they'll grow spring onion because mm. While some types of insects love the smell of sweet peppers, they don't like the smell of, of spring onions. So by mixing them together, you repel the insects mm-hmm. and you don't have to use pesticides, yeah. which is nice. It's uh, much more of a sustainable yeah. Yes, farming. sustainable farming, absolutely. Yeah. Have you seen that stress and anxiety? Because we've been talking a lot about that on the podcast, mm-hmm. about burnout and mm-hmm. the, the, the speed at which we're living and the speed at which we're working. And I was curious to know if you've seen an impact or a correlation between stress, anxiety, and inflammation. Yes, for sure. Stress increases your cortisol production, which drives your adrenals. And mm-hmm. um, it actually can f- switch the inflammatory switch on. So those genes for inflammation can get switched on. And then it can just go into a perpetual state. And there's a lot of research actually at looking at what that means then. For instance, we've just started doing the Schumacher protocol and treating CRS, which is chronic inflammatory response syndrome. And the Schumacher protocol and that physician in the States who's done the most research on actually chronic inflammation He believes a lot of it is stemmed from mold and toxic mold exposure from your environment. However, I think that stress can do the exact same thing that mold can. So if you're in a chronic stress state and you switch on those genes for inflammation, your body can get into that perpetual state of inflammation. And then you get food sensitivities, then your gut gut goes into dysbiosis, and then it's always difficult to find out what came first, the chicken or the egg, but there's always a kind of, you're caught in a loop, basically. Mm. Does stopping uh, the stress response heal it completely? Maybe if you could go into a monastery and go for a month and eat really clean food and meditate for eight or 10 hours a day, probably, Mm. um, and take a lot of probiotics. I think it's not practical for most humans to do that. Certainly, it's not even practical for somebody like me. So then it's a really about trying to do things in combination to stop the looping. So if you can stop the gene from being in that perpetual mode, so it's just switching that gene off, you almost have to rewind kind of the damage. And it's really programming. And people don't understand that. But we do something called Nate, which when you do Nate, after a while, you start to understand your nervous system and you start to understand how it becomes so programmed. But you actually have to reprogram your body not to have the same neurological patterning that it did. You can do that with bioenergetic treatments like we do in the clinic by doing adjustments and doing things like Nate. But it's also, it's about changing your diet. It is about de-stressing. It's about actually becoming more and more conscious about wellness and what it means to be healthy. And I think now we're in an era of wellness and hyper consciousness. People are striving to want more. They're striving towards asking questions about life purpose and what being a human being really means, which means they're waking up to understand that wellness means actually wheat doesn't necessarily mean that it's something, even though it's culturally something that makes me feel good and it's something that everybody does. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's healthy for me as an individual. And initially when you come to see somebody like me, it's a therapeutic aspect, but eventually the pennies fall and it becomes a lifestyle change. And then people start waking up and saying, okay, well, actually I feel much better. And through their own experience, they realize that this is, this is the way they want to stay. And I think eventually you're seeing that there's a lot of people who are even stranger than I am and have done a lot more research in the field of like quantum physics, etc. And there is a general theory that people are eating more and more cleaner and actually more and more liquids because we're, our consciousness is evolving and we're becoming lighter and human evolution will become lighter and lighter. We're becoming more, much more light beings than really dense material, dense kind of earthly humans yeah 
Do you find that it's easy for people generally to stick to a healthy lifestyle? It depends how conscious you are. So if somebody first comes in who just has symptoms and they haven't been solved, usually then it, there's a waking up process. So we start with three to four weeks. So I just ask them to do all of their changes with their diet, with what they take, what they don't take for three to four weeks. And just as a human experiment, come back and see me in three to four weeks and let's have another discussion. How do you feel? What's the difference? They need to do that because they need to actually commit to themselves that they can do it. And for three to four weeks, everybody generally does it. They wait a long time to get an appointment. So they have the will to do it by then. So after a month, then they feel better. And so they can go into another level. They, they say, okay, well, actually, I feel good. So I want to keep going now. Yeah. And then one, three to four weeks becomes three to four months. Of course, people do go back. But then I give them tools and techniques for doing that. I'm also not a person that, look, just because I eat almost 100% plant-based, if I go to somebody's house and they made salmon for me, I'm not the type of person that I would refuse to eat salmon either. I think people are in moderation. I do think people have very ethical diets, and so I would not tell a vegan to eat salmon if they were exposed to it. But I also am a person of moderation. So mm. if somebody's going to eat a pizza, I eat pizza once in a while, and there's nothing wrong with it. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. Good wood-fired pizza. Yeah. But, you know, the at the beginning, when somebody's becoming super clean and becoming more conscious about wellness, if they eat a pizza during week three then they might, they have a higher propensity to go back into the thinking of the habitual mind, mm -hmm. which one cheat can become two or three days of cheat, and then they can fall off the wagon, and then they can quickly go back into an inflammatory state. So then it's like, okay, we don't cheat for three or four weeks, and then, okay, if you're feeling really good, let's go for another couple of weeks, and then let's purposely actually cheat. And then when they do have a pizza, and they feel how they feel from that, then that also is a motivating factor to, to get to the point where I am, where it's like, okay, I don't need to eat that ever again. And then when I do, I consciously embody eating that pizza mm. and I love it. But it doesn't affect me like it used to. I don't have the same um, inflammatory responses, responses mm. that I would, ha would have had, you know, in earlier days. Yeah. Through goodness, we do a lot of work on eating disorders as well. Mm. And there's been a, a new term that's, I don't think it's accepted as a, I don't think it's. it's I know what you're going to say. Yes. <laughs> I'm going to talk about orthorexia. <laughs> so people's obsession with clean eating or, mm. or when it's when clean eating becomes obsessive, I guess. Yes. Um, I've seen that loads. I have loads of patients that have been eating super restrictive diet mm. for years and they come to me and then it's like I cannot ever eat this 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 yeah. no not no this no this yeah if people so there's two kinds of ways of looking at it first I'll just look at it from a kind of more of a clinical perspective if somebody it has to be on that kind of restricted diet to feel okay that means there is something deeper going on from a functional perspective to feel okay physically like if yes. they literally have to cut so out they everything feel yeah. like they can't eat anything without having a reaction then something's wrong then they have multiple chemical sensitivity which is linked often with a hidden mold or a hidden toxicity which is kept that gene of inflammation on and it isn't switched on even with food mm. and that happens and i would say probably I'm guessing clinically 15% of cases. Okay. So you can clean it a lot up with food, but then there's about 15% of people that have a clean diet and they still do it. And then if their diet even changes, then yeah. Yeah. Which means you have to do a further yeah. testing. Yeah. So that was the first. Yes. Yeah. That's the easy answer. Yeah. <laughs> the non-easy answer is I think people get fixed in everything. Being fixed in your thinking is going further and further into the hardwiring loop of your ego mind. So it's being more and more attached to something that makes you feel secure as a human being, which is farther and farther away from your actual truth and who you are as a human being. And that needs to be addressed. So if people come, for instance, so many people come and see me for weight loss. If people come and see me for weight loss, 
I will never put them on a weight loss diet. I do a lot of hormonal and inflammatory testing. And then we always have a conversation about the emotional aspect of eating. And I tell them that after three or four weeks, we start doing emotional uh, uh, techniques for removing trauma because everybody who eats emotionally becomes fixed in their thinking. So in a way, they feel empty. They don't feel adequate. They feel whatever is going on for them. And they use food as a way of feeling. Soothing. Yeah, yeah, soothing and feeling validated. It might even last for only a moment in time, but for that moment, it was a moment enough for them. So then it's about actually going back in their history, going back and heal whatever and wherever that comes from. It's no different whether you have somebody who has a body image issue or who is on uber clean eating and health, who's the ultimate healthiest person. If they're fixed in it, then they aren't actually on the healing mode fully. Mm. Do you know what I mean? So when clean eating becomes an obsession and it becomes, you hang on to it as part of your identity, then there is a problem there. Yeah. What are the you you mentioned people come to you for weight loss in general what are the most common conditions that people come to you with and what are the most common conditions you're seeing in this part of the world wow well we see everything i see tons of children i love kids everything from focus issues autism a lot of allergies we see a lot of women's health hormonal issues anxiety depression I have a great following of Emirati men, which is lovely to see. And in general, more and more men come and see me. And I love seeing guys. Uh, I like seeing, <laughs> it used to be only guys because their wives forced them to come and see mm. me, right? I have a lot of that, uh, a lot of guys come see me for that reason. And I always ask them on their first appointment, so who made you come to yeah. see me first? But more and more guys come because they actually are waking up and they want to change mm -hmm. their health, which is also really inspiring. And they all have the same issues, burnout, cortisol issues, mm. uh, adrenal dysfunction, feeling exhausted, mitochondrial dysfunction where you're brain tired fog. all the time, gut issues, yeah. brain fog. I have a lot of guys who come to just optimize functionality. So guys who are training, who want to have more energy, have more productivity and efficiency going to the gym and workouts so yeah everything I, I, I don't I wouldn't say there isn't anything that we don't see would you say that there are more instances of PCOS in this part of the world from your research or from maybe speaking to other doctors in this area I don't know because I've been here for 15 years so I only I'm sort of only clued in on the region but I would say in the last 17 years, I've definitely seen a rise in my practice. So I think it's global mm. and it's inflammation, it's stress, which is stress and inflammation are the worst. And I would say toxins, environmental toxins are the worst three com combinations, which then change your genes, mm. which turn everything on, which increase mitochondrial dysfunction and lead to PCOS, hormonal dysregulation, diabetes, mm. autoimmunity. When someone comes to see you, are there, what are the, like, let's say, for example, I came to see you and I told you, in general, I feel okay, but, you know, my energy is not always the best, and I sometimes sleep nine hours and wake up tired, and I suffer from a little, a few spots here and there around mm. my period, a few pimples. But in, in general, I just want to live a healthy, I just want to be healthier. I just want my body and my mind to be healthier. Mm. What, how would you start with me? Would you, what kind of tests would you ask me to do first? How would you approach someone who's not coming to you with a specific health condition, but rather someone who just wants to optimize? So I always ask if you've had a recent checkup. If you've had a recent checkup and done a few nutritional assessments, then I might not do any testing. I ask the patient if they want to do any testing as well. If they really don't have any major complaints, then I might just go into a treatment process. Mm -hmm. And that may look like anything from changing and modifying your diet to taking a couple anthroposophical medicines, providing nutritional support, 
if you want your hormones to regulate properly, you also have to make sure that the biochemistry has got the fuel, mm. which, is, which is proper nutrition. So just looking at all of those things in totality. And then I always, as the older I get in my practice, the more I go down the rabbit hole right away and talk about your inner world. Mm. Um, there's a lot of other doctors in the clinic now, so I'm starting to hand over some of the clinical nutrition and the other naturopathic and functional stuff. And I focus on what's really going on with you. Yeah. If you feel great, but there's always a but, then that also means you could go a little bit further in your own healing and start to explore what are things you are holding on to and you need to actually start to le- learn to let them go, mm. if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. Yeah. I'm I'm going to take it somewhere very far actually from from medicine but back to what you were saying maybe not so far from medicine actually but back to what you were saying about being a buddhist are you did you say you're a buddhist monk? No. I'm no. a buddhist. Yeah, I'm a buddhist anthroposophist I would say. So what is the buddhist perspective on what can seem like a difficult life sometimes, right? So I remember reading that there was a quote from Buddhism, which is life is suffering, and that it was actually a mistranslation of mm. the original texts. So I was wondering, you, you spoke about how to make it through, when, through life when things get dark. What's the Buddhist approach mm. to that? Buddhism is just mind science. I think people dogmatically follow it as a religion. But I think if you're conscious, you understand it just to be a mind science and it's a way of learning how to control your mind. So if you're in darkness, it's about having spent enough time focusing your mind and practicing mindfulness. So when you ap- darkness approaches you or you enter into darkness, you're conscious of that. And then it's your choice in that moment. And that's why it's always this, it's actually the, in the arrhythmia and anthroposophical medicine, it's the gesture of the eye, which is this reaching up and reaching to the earth at the same time, which is embodying your yourself, becoming more and more your highest self by letting go of all the things you aren't and your shadow aspect. You have to be willing at some point in your own healing to go into the darkest aspects of yourself and find the light. Because at the end of the day, you are light and it's your choice, although it's unconsciously, usually it's your choice of how you feel in any given moment. And so from a Buddhist perspective, it's almost insignificant because it's your choice. Mm. That dark, there is no darkness. It's your choice. When a dark time comes, it's really about um, choosing to find the light in it. It's that simple. Do you know Sam Harris? No. He's um, he created the app. What did he call? No, uh, waking up, waking okay. up by Sam Harris, mm. and he's also uh, trained by Buddhist monks mm. or might be a Buddhist monk, mm. I think. And uh, he created this app, which is a meditation and mindfulness app. And he always says, "There's no such thing as happiness when it's happiness now." So if you say, "I'll be happy when," you'll never actually be happy because when that day comes, something else will distract you or something else will upset you. But so the only choice that you have is saying, "I will be happy now." regardless of the circumstances. And I think you have to take it one step further, which is something I try to uh, teach my patients. If I asked you, um, Nor, how you feel when you feel drained, tired, insecure, scared, afraid, depressed, sad, you'd be like, oh, I feel this, blah, 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 blah. You would be able to rattle off exactly how how you feel. If I asked you how you feel when you feel awesome, when you feel confident, when you feel completely in an all-knowing state or in yourself, most people actually don't know what that feels like. So it's a weakened muscle, but it's actually your highest self. So it is actually feeling it as well. So you can tell yourself you're happy and positive affirmations aren't a negative thing. They're a positive thing, but they only really work if you actually physically feel that. So you have to take that statement one step further. And in this moment, if we want to leave the room saying, okay, I'm going to feel happy for the rest of the day, that would have to be an inner statement that goes down into your will and you physically feel, allow yourself to physically feel happy until it's kind of anchored in and then start the rest of your day like that. So more than just a statement, you have to feel it in the rest of your body. Yeah, absolutely. Just to bring it back to you, Mm -hmm as 
Dr. Lanal. <laughs> yeah. You are a mother of yes. two. Yeah. You are an entrepreneur. Mm-hmm. I'm guessing you also spend a lot of time on researching and studying mm-hmm. the different fields that you're involved yes. in. Yes. You're do also a lot of homework. Yeah. You're also a surfer. Yes. Yeah. How do you balance all of these aspects of who you are? I think it goes back to practicing what you preach. And I've evolved around my kids. So I had my kids really quite early. I finished, I actually had my daughter doing it during my board licensing exams. My son was during med school, actually. <laughs> so they came here very young. I took the first couple of years off. I realized when I had my son right away, because I was exploring Chinese medicine and homeopathy in different ways of looking at a human being in different terms of what it means to be a human being. When I had my first child, I really thought, okay, if I'm going to be a parent, it also, I also have to look at education should be just like the, the stuff I'm learning. I mean, what if kids learned Chinese medicine as part of normal education? Mm. So I started questioning a lot of things right away. Um, I think kids make you wake up consciously. So I think I've grown and my consciousness, I've grown as a human being and they've been my greatest teachers. So it allowed me at the beginning to take more time off. My work schedule, I worked part-time and then eventually I worked, uh, I also started a Waldorf school initiative here 14 years ago. So I worked at that school initiative once a week, which uh, afforded me more time with the kids. And I didn't work full days at the beginning. I took the weekends off. And then as they got a little bit older and I started my own clinic, I started working more. Now they're both teenagers, one's in the UK and one is leaving to go to college in the fall. And so now I have more freedom, Mm. but I've also raised them a lot more consciously and spent time from a quality perspective rather than kind of a circumstantial perspective. And I've been gifted to live in Dubai, and I I have a lovely lady that's been with me for 14 years, and she's helped me. So she's helped me in a home perspective, take my values Mm -hmm. and the way I do things in my house and model that, which has been great. So I haven't cooked every meal for sure for the last 15 years, but certainly I've taught her how to make everything I cook, Mm -hmm. and she's been able to replicate a lot of that. And then I do things like my kids and I travel. My son and I have gone to the Maldives together and just surfed and scuba dived every single day and free dived. And him and I go on climbing dates, for instance. So I specifically do certain things with each child that we like to do, that they like to do. And I, yeah, I foster just really quality relationships with both my kids. And I try to do that at the clinic as well. I try to focus on what the really the key things in in that I have to do. And it's taken me a little bit. We've we've moved in the last year and a half and expanded and really partnered with Sustainable City to really become a model of sustainable medicine in an integrative form. But even start thinking about where your supplements come from, Mm. from a sustainable perspective, because if you really start looking at them, most of them aren't actually sustainably sourced. So just... Focusing, I'm starting to really focus on the things that count and have other people in place that can do it rather than me just trying to take it all on. And I think that's an inner perspective again. I think as a woman, we we have control issues. We want to control everything, especially as a mom. You want to be like a helicopter Helicopter, (laughs) and hover over your kids and make sure everything is perfect. Their meal is perfect. Vacuum packed lunch is going to school every day, all of those kind of things. But I think the more you work on yourself, the more you can think, see which things are really key elements that need to be in place and which things you have to be present which allows you also, when you practice mindfulness in your own self regularly, to be very present with them when you have time. So when my daughter comes home, I make sure I do have time and we do really quality things. Sometimes she just needs us to to veg out because she hasn't been in her own room for six weeks. So she needs space, which is it gives me the time to work on my computer and do admin for the clinic, for instance, and work on marketing strategies or other things that we need to be working on. 
and you have to love life, right? Yeah. And I think that's a big part of it. If you want to be balanced, then you have to find lightness in everything. So when it gets a bit heavy and you feel like things aren't balanced, then you have to feel light. And then it's like, okay, I'm feeling it's a bit too heavy. And then it's okay. I got to get to the beach. I got to go for a swim. If there's no waves. I've got, I got to do something fun. We need to, I don't know, do something. So yeah, I try to do that. Just to wrap things up. Okay. What are your, I know my generation, we love like quick advice. Like anything that takes less than two seconds to implement is, is right where we are. No. Um, what is your, what would be your advice? Maybe let's say three tips that you could share with our listeners for starting to make changes in your life. Maybe we can say one for mind, one for body and one for soul. If you look at it like that. I think remembering that you're a human being is fundamental for starters. And then three things would be first thing I can think of is finding wonder and joy in the world. Finding, looking in that flower and just feeling amazed because that thing is amazing. So finding wonder and joy in anything. You forget why, what you felt when you were five, but that's so important as an adult. So yes, finding wonder in the world feeling love on a regular basis. People don't love themselves. They look for it externally. And that's the biggest thing. Stop finding purpose and finding external sources to satisfy you and find happiness. Everything is within you. Your life purpose, everybody is looking for it outside, but it's actually right within yourself. And when you start looking within yourself, you find it anyway. It just follows you, of course, because you already know it. Is that helpful? Very helpful. Okay, cool. <laughs> Thank you so much. It was great having you on the podcast yeah, today. Yeah, me too. I enjoyed it a lot. Thanks Thank for inviting you. me. Thanks for listening today. If you're not familiar with goodness, head to www.goodness.me to access the online platform and articles and follow us at goodness on Instagram. If you enjoyed this podcast, please rate, review and share it. And we'll see you next week.